Um, and um, yes, so, you know, for those of you, again, um, as Zach had mentioned, for those of you who were not able to attend the first three workshops in this series, I highly recommend that you check out the recordings as, um, you know, the knowledge that we have built over the past few weeks is really going to be foundational for the topics we are discussing today, which relate to the U.S. war in Afghanistan and the essentially four decades of U.S political and military involvement in the country. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the reason I say that is is not just out of, I think, respect for the, the history um, of Afghanistan, which is long and dates back far beyond uh, the current four decades of, of war um, and, you know, really, unfortunately, uh, misery for a lot of Afghans, but um, is also, you know, really, really uh, critical for the volunteer um, work that you'll be embarking on in terms of treating Afghans with respect, but also um, understanding the diverse backgrounds that they come from and the diverse past that they carry with them. So um, I really appreciate all of you who uh, have been active participants in the past few weeks. And um, obviously, you know, today's subject is close to home in that um, the war in Afghanistan was the United States' longest war to date, and one that certainly was quite confusing for a lot of people in its complexity, in its reasoning, um, and also in the fact that four different presidents managed the conflict in one way or another, and as a result, um, the policy uh, continued to change and not necessarily in organic um, and natural progressions, um, and certainly not in ways that uh, enhanced the success of the mission. So um, we are going to uh, start off actually with, um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna go all the way back to the front. All right, you got a preview of the uh, final activity. Um, we are going to start actually with uh, this, the reign of, of this man, Mohammed Zahir Shah, um, who we kind of, we ended with his rise to power in 1933 and the successive decades of his rule in Afghanistan um, in what is, you know, uh, you know, both the interwar period between World War I and World War II, as well as the decades after World War II the rise of the Cold War, um, and his reign ends in 1973 for reasons that we will get to in a moment. But I actually wanted to start today with a quote from um, the scholar Benedict Anderson, who studies the creation of nation states in the modern world. Um, and one of the uh, really profound quotes that that um, was actually uh, made in this book, which I highly recommend to you all and, and is included in the um, session resources, um, Epic Encounters by Melanie McAllister. Um, the quote is, all profound changes in consciousness uh, by their very nature bring with them characteristic amnesias and out of those oblivions spring narratives. And for those of you who were present for session one about stereotypes, you are well aware of the kinds of narratives that have sprung out of US engagement with both the Muslim world, the Middle East, South Asia, um, and you know certainly U.S. foreign policy in the Cold War, those narratives are profound ways for both politicians and the general public to understand the United States' role in the world and to understand itself. Um, in fact, a lot of the ways that the United States has defined itself since the fall of the Soviet Union have had to do with its involvement in Afghanistan and in the war on terror um, at large. But it's also important to really, really be careful when we examine these narratives because they are narratives. And as a result, you know, like good stories um, that you might read in a, in a book of fiction or in a journalistic work, um, the facts are usually arranged in a way such that they are convenient for the telling of a good story, one that is compelling and convincing. Um, and when we use the lens, right, the lens that we talked about in session one for examining media, we can see how those facts were arranged in order to convince the American public that uh, 
uh, the war in Afghanistan was something that should last beyond simply the fall of the Taliban. Because for those of you who watched the news at the time, the Taliban uh, fell in a matter of months. And yet the United States stayed there for 20 years. So we are going to examine why that was the case, uh, why there were several decades of engagement between the US and Afghanistan prior to that, that set the stage for the conflict, as well as the reason uh, and the policies that mired the United States in this country for so long and, and have caused uh, so much suffering uh, on top of you know, the two decades of war that Afghanistan had already faced up to that point. So again, back to uh, Mohammed Zahir Shah, um, who, for those of you who were present last week, um, will know that uh, will know as a as a uh, monarch who took power at a time when Afghanistan was enmeshing itself in the modern world in uh, more and more ways, but in ways that were very very uh, in line with the kinds of cultural fusion that had been occurring for centuries in the country. And so, although um, at this time under this person's rule, Afghanistan opened itself to uh, huge amounts of Western tourism to huge amounts of foreign aid, and certainly in kind of an active participant in the politics of the Cold War. The that engagement was not simply a one way transfer of, of information or culture rather Afghanistan Afghans uh, really embodied these kinds of cultures in their own ways uh, and through their own um, unique kind of cultural fusion. However, um, today we're, you know, last week we really talked about a kind of cultural history uh, for this session. You know, we're going we're gonna to talk more about politics, uh, given that, unfortunately, the 70s is when the really intense conflicts, both political and then military, begin um, disrupting Afghan life significantly. And so in 1973, when Mohammad Zahir Shah is overthrown by his uh, actually his um, uh, his relative, President Mohammad Daoud Khan. Afghanistan was was steeped in a region that was undergoing significant Republican, uh, meaning you know not Republican capital R, but in the sense of uh, political movements attempting to establish republics um, as political governments. Uh, in the region of the Middle East, as well as South Asia. Uh, not only had um, British India been decolonized uh, in 1948 into the now you know, independent states of India and Pakistan, but in the Middle East, um, monarchies were that had been holdovers from the uh, First World War uh, established by European governments, you know, as sort of client states were, were falling rapidly. And, and, you know, one of the, for those of you who, who are uh, students of history, one of the, the great examples of that is, is what happens in Egypt in, in the 1950s with uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and the free officers coup, which essentially brings um, a military government into power um, under the, the guise essentially of creating a, a democratic republic for, for Egyptians. And of course, similarly in the 70s, uh, this is when we see the height of um, anti-monarchical protests in, in Afghanistan's neighbor, in Iran. Um, and in 1979, uh, again, for those of you who were uh, who are students of history or were around at the time, we see the, the Shah of Iran, a key U.S. ally in the Middle East, fall to a popular uprising. This, has, this leads to a really tumultuous political landscape, and one certainly that Afghan politicians began seeing as advantageous not only for their own political careers, but for the um, future of Afghanistan in this heady modern world of political ideas, of enormous political dreams. Um, you know, of course, we're also seeing uh, many, many, um, you know, utopian uh, political movements, um, communist political movements in the region. And what happens is essentially the the monarchy of Mohammad Zahir Shah became a target for these kinds of um, big picture political movements. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Mohammad Dahoud Khan was not was by no means a representative of the, of the people. He was, as I said, the, the, a relative 
of the royalty. He had previously served as a prime minister under Muhammad Zahir Shah. But the the force of the uprising is is caused by you know many of the the actions that that Zahir Shah's regime took, such as uh, repressing popular uprisings by labor movements, by students, as well as um, many of the, the reforms that they were uh, attempting to undergo. And, and Mohammed Dawood Khan's regime comes into power in 1973. And this is when the, the floodgates really begin opening. Um, Dawood Khan attempts to open political debate um, more than, than under his predecessor. And in the 70s, um, the uh, establishment of several independent Afghan political parties includes the establishment of what is called the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA. And that is essentially the Afghan Communist Party. And uh, the communists become extremely influential in Afghan cities. Um, not only is Afghanistan at that time on the borders of the Soviet Union's territories in Central Asia, so there's a significant exchange of ideas between Central Asian communists and Afghan politicians. Um, there are also lots of um, um, leaders of the PDPA who are studying abroad, not only in the Soviet Union, but in the United States. Um, and so to give you a sense of some of those people, uh, actually the, the man second from the left, uh, his name's Hafizullah Amin, we'll talk about him in, in a little bit. Uh, he actually studied at Columbia Teachers College and uh, the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And, and at that time, Madison was um, really a, a hotbed of student activism. And, and that's where Hafizullah Amin kind of cut his teeth, uh, getting a sense of, of leftism um, and student activism. In any case, um, there, these, this political discourse, which is again opened up a bit more by Daoud Khan, um, leads on quite quickly to a um, popular, or sorry, not a, uh, a political coup uh, enacted by the PDP. And at that time, um, the leader was a man all the way on the left, uh, Nur Muhammad Taraki. And uh, he was a former writer turned revolutionary. And the reason I've included all four of these, these men on this, this uh, slide is because um, the 1978 revolution, as it's called, the Sour Revolution, which is the month uh, that it took place in, in the Afghan calendar, um, opens the floodgates even more for political instability. Um, there is an extremely quick succession of, of different rulers. So Taraki, the guy all the way on the left, rules from 1978 to the fall of 1979. Hafizullah Amin rules for a, couple, a few months, essentially, in 1979. Um, before giving way to um, Babrak Karmal, uh, third uh, person from left to right, who rules, you know, through the 1970s with, or sorry, 1980s with Soviet support, uh, before giving way to Mohammad Najibullah, uh, the person all the way on the right, um, who rules for a few years uh, before um, being essentially deposed by uh, Mujahideen forces. Now, another thing that's happening simultaneously to all of this is that uh, Afghanistan is learning to live with a new neighbor. And uh, that neighbor is the nascent state of Pakistan, which gained independence in, in 1948, as I mentioned earlier, during the partition of British India. And um, Pakistan is a, a state that essentially its northern border is a colonial drawn border from uh, the time when Afghanistan was having its Anglo-Afghan wars with the, the British Empire, uh, which again, we, we talked about a little bit last session. This red line on this map is called the Durand Line. Uh, it was drawn by a, a British colonial officer and, named Durand. And what it does is it splits directly in half. Uh, those of you who are, uh, you know, again, familiar with the history of South Asia will know uh, this appears to be a, a British habit. Um, it splits directly in half the territories inhabited primarily by Pashtun tribes. So that kind of orange overlay um, in the middle of the picture uh, generally encapsulates the areas where, where Pashtuns were, were predominant. And 
what happens, of course, is that many Pashtuns are, are, are stuck on one side of the border and many are, are stuck on the other side. Um, so certainly Afghanistan maintains a, a large community of Pashtuns, but Pakistan also ha now has a large community of Pashtuns in its north. And there were frequent sparring sessions between Afghan politicians, um, basically, you know, uh, be beginning in the 40s uh, and continuing through the 70s about what to do about this, because Afghan politicians were in favor of a independent Pashtunistan. Uh, this, this country does not exist, um, but, you know, that that was what they were hoping for. And for Afghan politicians, that would have been advantageous, a friendly southern neighbor, um, a, it was a great rallying cry, given the plurality of Pashtuns in the modern state of Afghanistan. But the Pakistan, uh, you know, the, the leaders of Pakistan were, were not on board with this idea. Um, they didn't want to be deprived of a large section of their, their um, northern border. Um, and, you know, certainly also, uh, to kind of flashback to next, last week, um, the areas in the northwest frontier province where a lot of Pashtuns still live, um, was is a very strategic area. So, you know, just keep this in mind, because uh, as we go through today's session, the interplay between Pakistani politics and Afghan politics is very profound. Um, and it continues to be profound, not just in the 40s when the borders of Pakistan are being debated, but um, up through the United States uh, war in Afghanistan up till the present day. Returning to the political narrative, um, as uh, we were discussing, the PDPA goes through, cycles through a, a group of leaders very quickly. And what, what ends up occurring is that um, the political situation, the economic situation in Afghanistan becomes extremely precarious. The communists are not particularly well liked outside of cities. They they certainly had um, certain strong support from Afghan elites, but actually the man on the left, Tataraki, in a in a conversation with his uh, with the prime minister of, of the or sorry not the prime minister but the the premier of the Soviet Union uh, Kosygin at the time said uh, we don't have you know because Kosygin asks him. Well, where are your supporters? Uh, can't you go, you know, rally up people? And Taraki says, I, I don't think uh, the people are going to vouch for us. It's it's only the people in the the lycée, the the you know French word for school, essentially indicating right that the only people who had the backs of the PDPA were high ranking elites who already had access to education. And the infighting between these characters also produces a lot of rifts, not only within the government, but within the country um, and disagreements over the future of Afghanistan, over the interpretation of, of communist thought um, all drive these these um, rifts. And yet also uh, the policies that they are enacting, whether it's the repression of Muslim religious practices, land reform or uh, mass killings. Uh, they they all cons uh, conspire to produce widespread discontent among Afghans. And this is the point at which the Afghan refugee crisis really begins. Uh, Seven million people flee the country during these times. And uh, going forward, the, the refugee situation only grows. Of course, also at the time, um, Afghanistan's neighbors are undergoing profound religious revival, revival movements. As we had you know, mentioned in 1979, the Shah of Iran is, is overthrown by a popular revolution. And the, the leader who emerges, Ayatollah Khomeini, um, is, a, you know, is interested in making Iran an Islamic Republic and very much frames his, his doctrine as one of neither East or West. Um, that's actually a, kind of a direct quote from Khomeini. And, um, meanwhile, on the southern border, um, Pakistan gains a new military leader in 1977, uh, Zia ul Haq, who overthrows uh, the socialist prime minister at, at the time, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and makes Islam, uh, essentially Islamic revival in Pakistan the program, official program of the government. So 
there, there is certainly a lot of, of political ideology swirling around. And in this context, um, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, Leonid Brezhnev, becomes extremely concerned about the, the situation in Afghanistan and particularly the precarity of the PDPA. Um, and there are actually some newly declassified documents uh, that indicate um, Hafizullah Amin, the man second from the left, uh, was so worried about his political fate that he began meeting with U.S. diplomats to see if he could essentially realign Afghanistan towards the U.S. Uh, and the Soviets become extremely worried about this because uh, the U.S. has just lost a great ally in, in the Shah of Iran, um, and they don't want uh, the U.S. to gain a new ally on its southern border. All these things uh, kind of, again, conspire in, in a uh, mix. And what occurs is, this is just, a, and, you know, again, uh, something we, we looked at yesterday, the uh, Soviet um, influence in Afghanistan. What occurs is that the Soviet Union invades um, very prominently in 1979, uh, late, late 1979, to essentially prop up the government. Um, Hafizullah Amin is killed and Babrak Karmal uh, comes to power. And when the Soviet Union invades, uh, for several years, it um, causes widespread um, uh, confusion and, and destruction in Afghanistan. You know, infrastructure that had been built up over decades um, is now being destroyed uh, by bombings and, and airplanes and artillery. And the resistance fighters who are opposing the Soviet Union's invasion, which again, this is a very popular resistance movement given how uh, poorly the PDPA had managed the country. Um, they don't have the equipment or the know-how to oppose this extremely sophisticated army that has come in with tanks, with airplanes, with helicopters, with artillery. Um, and yet, after a few years, it appears that um, you know, the Mujahideen is hanging on, but not winning the war. And there becomes a significant interest among um, certain kind of elements in US foreign policy, including the, the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, to provide covert support for the Mujahideen um, as they uh, became known. Um, and the interest was essentially to mire the Soviet Union in a Vietnam-like situation, a stalemate that was um, unwinnable, that you know essentially uh, hemorrhaged funds for the Soviets. And what um, the US sees, uh, you know, especially you know, for those of you who have seen the, the film Charlie Wilson's War, uh, that, that film actually depicts kind of this process of convincing various allies and um, people within the, in, within Congress to support this effort, which becomes known as Operation Cyclone. Uh, the U.S. cultivates allies among um, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan as essentially go-betweens for this support. And so when Operation Cyclone is funded, um, the weapons, the funds, and the ideas that the United States wants to essentially transmit to the Mujahideen covertly um, is done so through Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. You know, not only is that important diplomatic cover um, because you know the direct uh, financing of an opposition movement like this uh, could have uh, really accelerated tensions with the Soviet Union, but there's also you know the the aspect of being deniable. Um, the United States does not want to be caught red-handed providing weapons so directly. And Pakistan and Saudi Arabia uh, agree to essentially help um, funnel, funnel ideas and money and guns, but they also are active participants in this process. They are not just uh, the go-betweens, um, but rather uh, Saudi Arabia had had a, a presence, a financial presence in Pakistan for, for several years at that point. And the war becomes a great reason to pour even more money into the country. Now, this money primarily goes towards funding a network of religious schools along, particularly along uh, Pakistan's northern border, where because of the, um, because fear of the PDPA, as well as the war at that point for, which had been going on for several years, there was a significant refugee population. So 
this is also occurring under a government um, in Pakistan, the regime of Zia al-Haq, which, as I had said, made um, Islamic revival uh, essentially an official government program. And the schools uh, that are set up um, essentially take the place of civil uh, you know, school network in Pakistan, which had become, de had become extremely degraded at that point. Religious schools were really the only place where people could send their children to gain some measure of an education. Uh, and particularly for the poor Afghans in refugee camps, if there was a religious school nearby, you know, that was the only, that was really the only option. However, these schools are essentially unsupervised, um, much like the phenomenon of non non denominational churches in the United States. Uh, there is not a lot of oversight. Um, the kinds of creeds that are being preached in these schools are extremely sectarian, uh, very extreme, and generally are not a well, you know, researched um, version of Islamic law or Islamic thought, but rather, uh, you know, a had certain intentions behind them. And, and a lot of those intentions related to the war. Uh, there are actually textbooks from the time funded by USAID that um, teach, uh, Af you know, are supposed to teach Afghan children the alphabet in Pashto, but use things like K is for Kalashnikov, right? And, and you, can, you can tell at this point that um, really Afghans on Pakistan's northern border served one significant purpose, and that was leverage in the war that was going on um, on the border. An additional uh, aspect of this, aside from the religious ideas that were being tr uh, transmitted, were the um, weapons and the money. Now, the, the weapons uh, had clear purposes, um, you know, certainly for the fact of dealing with Soviet air power. Um, ground to air missiles were extremely important in leveling the playing field for the Mujahideen. But significant amounts of money as well. And um, as we will see, uh, dependence on US funds is a uh, tr kind of tragic theme that uh, is a through line into the US war, US own, US's own war in Afghanistan. Um, but in any case, at this point, the money is extremely attractive for many Mujahideen commanders. And um, many of them begin cultivating active relationships with uh, Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, which uh, basically, I'm sorry, my slides are going for some reason. Um, and they, they, they cultivate those, those relationships with ISI, as it's called, because they want access to this pipeline of, of weapons and, and funds. Those relationships um, remain in place when the Soviet Union eventually leaves the country. And at this time also, um, we begin to see the rapid, uh, essentially Islamification of the Mujahideen campaign against the Soviet Union. Although there had certainly always been an element of um, religion in the reasoning behind the resistance, um, you know, because the PDPA was repressive to uh, Islamic, you know, public displays of piety um, and Islamic forms of clothing and stuff like that. Um, there was not the sense that this was a sort of religious war of global import, but US support uh, through Saudi Arabia and Pakistan really changes that. Um, the United States at this time saw Islam as essentially a extremely convincing narrative to deploy against the Soviet Union through the Mujahideen. And this is when we really see the, the campaign in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union become something that attracts worldwide attention for its Islamic character. Um, I've showed this slide before, but this is uh, Ronald Reagan meeting with members of the Afghan Mujahideen in 1983 when US support uh, you know, really started in full. Um, and reason I show this is, is uh, the American public was, uh, you know, really primed in certain ways uh, to uh, see the Mujahideen campaign through, you know, its, its familiar cultural figures. So this is the, the poster of Rambo three, which actually takes place in Afghanistan during uh, the war of the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union and portrays the Mujahideen in a very sympathetic light. Um, the Islamification of the, the 
um, war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan attracts also a, a new cast of characters who we begin seeing uh, grow in prominence through the late 90s, uh, late 80s and the 1990s. Um, one of them includes uh, Osama bin Laden, pictured on the left with his associate Ayman al-Zawahiri, and the um, also the uh, very charismatic uh, leader Abdullah Azam. All three of these people become closely associated with Al-Qaeda, uh, the organization responsible for the attacks of September 11 in the United States, as well as um, fighters in the Mujahideen ranks uh, during the uh, war against the Soviet Union of the 1980s. They come to Afghanistan seeking the um, the fulfilling spiritual experience of fighting in a holy war, in a jihad. Um, Mujahideen literally means those who do jihad. Um, and they, they become enmeshed in the networks of uh, Mujahideen. Um, Osama bin Laden actually, you know, is not, although he's always pictured with, the, with, with weaponry, he's not really a fighter in this conflict, rather he uh, leverages his family's extreme fortunes to, you know, essentially provide financial support for the movement. And they make a lot of contacts, but also in this mix of war and, and funds and guns, um, they find a sort of niche to begin um, essentially incubating a new kind of movement, um, one that was not focused necessarily on taking power in a certain in one particular country, but rather projecting um, this idea of holy war across the world. And eventually, you know, as the 1980s drag on, the Soviet Union is facing its own problems um, at home. The war in Afghanistan for them is a massive drain on resources, and uh, eventually, Soviet forces withdraw. The Mujahideen declare victory in the country, and it appears for the United States that um, the objective has been completed. Um, the Soviet Union has been drawn into a years-long conflict that uh, where they've hemorrhaged funds, and uh, and as well as as young people fighting in the conflict, and the United States essentially at this point says, "Okay, well, um, mission complete. Uh, we are." no longer involved. But unfortunately, uh, no surprise here, the weapons that were provided, the funds that were injected, and the ideas that were um, produced to energize the conflict are still circulating. And tragically, um, the, uh, the defeat of Soviet forces leads to uh, another three decades of, of conflict in this country um, and the, you know, the infrastructure, the lives that have been lost during uh, the war against the Soviet Union, those things only, those damages only grow um, over the next few decades. I'm going to take a water break. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm going to look at the chat real quick. Okay. Um, All right. The next chapter in this conflict is the what is known as the Afghan Civil War. And this is where we witness the emergence of the Taliban as, as a genuine political movement. Now, the Mujahideen commanders who fought in the um, what is known as the Soviet Afghan War now are left with huge bases of support, uh, you know, usually of armed young men. And are unclear as to how to divvy up the spoils. Um, there is not a unified sense of what the government of Afghanistan will look like after the Soviet Union um, is expelled. Uh, certainly, they all agreed that there should be some form of Islamically in, uh, influenced government in Afghanistan. But they did not agree on the, the exact character of that. They didn't agree on um, you know, what interpretation of Islam would be uh, the, the basis for uh, the new country's laws. And what essentially occurs is similar to what occurred with the PDPA, they, they begin infighting. Um, each of these commanders kind of takes their own chunk of the country uh, for, 
you know, their own little territory and they have plenty of followers with weapons to carve out those territories. Um, there are several sieges of major Afghan cities. Kabul itself was leveled multiple times by rocket attacks. Um, there might be some faces on the screen that you recognize. You know, the person in the in the direct middle has actually gained you know quite a bit of admiration in the West for being a particularly uh, effective military commander and somebody supposedly influenced by humanitarian principles. Uh, his name's Ahmed Shah Massoud. Um, you know, there's there's an interesting linguistic uh, work happening. Uh, you know, he's he's called a commander, but uh, the people in the bottom left, uh, Golbuddin Hikmatyar, and the person in the bottom in the top right, Abdul Rashid Dostum, they're called warlords. Um, all these people were warlords. They all had uh, militias that were um, oppressing uh, innocent Afghans, extorting them for funds, and they were all. Uh, taking part in the violence that was occurring to attempt to essentially rule the country in a unified way. Um, so, you know, again, as you're perhaps exploring Afghan history on your own, um, try to look at the narrative that is is being uh, told. The reason Ahmad Shah Massoud might be lionized so much is that he was a U.S. ally uh, and he was an extremely effective U.S. ally for many years. Um, in any case, what what is occurring in Afghanistan is at this time, you know, is not uh, going unnoticed in neighboring countries. And as conditions within Afghanistan fuel even more displacement, even more poverty, you know, the banking and commercial section uh, sectors of the economy effectively collapse. At this point, the narcotics trade is the country's largest source of income, and. Um, the displacement of Afghans to uh, refugee camps, particularly in northern Pakistan, uh, grows unabated. And this this is the, the birthplace of the Taliban. Um, pictured here is Mullah Omar, who was uh, considered for many years the, the leader of the Taliban movement. Um, he's, he's now dead. Um, he was extremely secretive as well, so it, it is quite difficult to uh, say much about his you know, personal beliefs or ideology, but um, certainly the movement that, that grew uh, under his leadership embraced a form of, of uh, an interpretation of Islam that was extreme, to say the least. Um, and not only was the movement born out of extreme conditions, born in the impoverished refugee camps of, of northern Pakistan with very little education, with lots of weapons, with lots of money for people who are willing to, to fire those weapons, um, but there was also a, a political program, and I think that this is this is important to remember is that the while the you know the amnesias that occurred um, after 9/11 for a lot of Americans tr struggling to understand who the Taliban was, why the United States was going to war in, in the country, what you know one of the amnesias uh, was that the the Taliban was some sort of international terrorist group. That is that is just not true. Uh, the Taliban was born as a as a politically motivated group that sought to unify Afghanistan as a country and exert political power as the rulers. It's that simple. Um, and you know, in the way that Afghan politics was being run at that time, uh, they they grew a mass of followers who were armed and you know captured territory by force, as were the Mujahideen warlords at the time. However. The religious ideology and the cultural background that they brought um, was was a, a mix of uh, extremist uh, Islam that was being preached in these unsupervised religious schools um, that were again funded by uh, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, as well as um, the kind of traditional uh, Pashtun codes of conduct and law, which are called the Pashtun Wali, and which really organized political and legal life in the remote rural southern regions of Afghanistan quite a bit. And what uh, ends up happening is that the Taliban is extremely successful when they enter the fray. Um, not only are people uh, despondent about the future of the country under the Mujahideen warlords, uh, who again had been extorting them, uh, kidnapping their, their friends and family um, for ransom, you know, essentially doing anything to make a buck, the Taliban seems 
to provide an effective, um, you know, military force and, and, and form of law that will stamp out these kinds of crime and corruption. One of, you know, some of the initial steps that they took were reopening highways into, into Pakistan and ensuring safe transit along those roads, enabling commerce, enabling imports, that kind of thing. And the warlords who are fighting them are essentially too fragmented to mount an effective resistance. And as I said, were also extremely unpopular. Momentarily, the Taliban occupation of Afghanistan ends the chaos of these warring factions and provides some level of solace from the constant war that had been going on for uh, more than a decade at that point. However, the Taliban proves essentially completely incompetent at governing. And many of the problems that emerged during the civil war were exacerbated as the Taliban became authoritarian rulers, implementing a distorted interpretation of Islamic law. And while they're seeking international recognition, this is undermined by the fact that uh, its repressive rule was, um, was returning women to uh, a state of having no rights at all. And their reliance on the narcotics trade was also uh, exacerbating any attempt to really uh, have good PR among Western powers. And the Mujahideen commanders who had been deposed by the Taliban renew their, their fight. And a group called the Northern Alliance springs up in the late 90s to fight uh, the Taliban. This is the time at which Osama bin Laden returns to the country. Uh, he was off, uh, you know, again, building this international network, um, you know, as was his goal to, to wage holy war around the world. And he returns to Afghanistan, uh, essentially, you know, uh, believing that the Taliban would harbor him, uh, which they did. And they, Bin Laden, again, had uh, a lot of contacts in the region from his days as a Mujahideen commander in Afghanistan. So he fit kind of right back into the mold that uh, he had carved out for himself. And this, you know, leads to uh, what we, you know, uh, then know as the, the events that led to the US war in Afghanistan. Um, I'm going to stop here again and, and just look at the questions. Can you, okay, so Judy asks, can you remind us why Russia went into Afghanistan in the first place? Um, so the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan because the, of, of, of a couple different reasons, the most prominent being that the communist government led by the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the PDPA, was essentially toppling, um, not just under the pressures of its own infighting, amidst the party, but also the unpopular policies that were uh, marginalizing most of the country's uh, population, which was, you know, as you might imagine, not uh, international school educated um, elites. And, you know, they, they saw the, the threat that a, a US aligned Afghanistan might also pose on their southern border, you know, for many, many years at that point, uh, the the US alliance with Iran um, and the Shah's government had been a thorn in their side. And, um, you know, the initial attempts at uh, courting US support by uh, the PDPA layer, leader Hafizullah Amin really spooked the Soviet Union. And um, this, this motivated what they thought would be a quick and easy job. You know, Afghanistan was not a country with a sophisticated military, um, and they thought it would be uh, easy to shore up this government, um, provide Soviet protection for it, and essentially leave. Um, and obviously that wasn't the case. Um, Lina Oleik says, wasn't Ahmed Shah Massoud an ally with Iran as well? The influence of Iran in Afghan politics is, is quite interesting. And um, it, 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 it sort of exhibits a similar level of uh, confusion and, and also double dealing that the um, the influence of, of Pakistan in Afghan politics did. Um, Iran um, also had, you know, contacts with several Mujahideen commanders 
uh, they're most notably actually the the person who they had the most contact with was uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who um, you know became kind of an outcast among the the Northern Alliance folks, um, and actually had some crossover with the Taliban um, because his you know militia and, and his political group uh, advocated for kind of more extreme forms of Islamic government. Um, Nargis says he was after the best interests of Afghanistan, and for that he had to get along with the Iran and U.S. Um, yeah, I mean, I, unfortunately, I, I have to say, uh, you know, Ahmad Shah Massoud has had great PR. That's really the the un unfortunate um, truth of it. Uh, there are no heroes in this conflict. Um, he was a warlord, just like all the others. Um, so. At this point, um, we are going to transition into you know discussing the war, and I know you know we're at six fifty, so um, I want to make sure that we can get to a Q and A period and as well as some some discussion. When Bin Laden returns to Afghanistan, he not only is going into this this context of uh, you know two decades of con of conflict of of extremely intense armed conflict, um, but he's also going into a context where the Soviet Union at that point had fallen. Um, when the Soviets withdrew, uh, there were you know a few years left, but the Cold War at this point has ended, and yet the same ideology of anti-imperialism that was deployed to uh, fight the Soviet Union, uh, cultivated by the U.S. and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia actively during the Cold War, is now turned against the U.S. Uh, without the Soviet Union there, the United States is now the preeminent global power that is projecting its military might across the world, particularly the Muslim world. And bin Laden essentially, you know, that, that's the next step in his, in his global campaign. The Soviet Union has now been defeated by uh, the holy war that, that he and his colleagues waged. This is the narrative. This is not uh, my version of things. Um, and the Taliban is in a precarious position. Um, bin Laden's program of global jihad is incompatible with their main goal, which was uniting Afghanistan and ruling it uh, in a way that they saw fit. Yet expelling bin Laden was also difficult given his really iconic status among many of the Taliban's uh, allies at that point in uh, the Muslim world, namely Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Um, Mullah Omar actually compared him once to a, a chicken bone in his throat. He could neither completely swallow him or, or uh, expel him. Uh, and that was that was really the, the the feeling that among a lot of Taliban leaders is what do we do with this guy? He is attracting a lot of attention from the United States. And uh, in the late 90s, there were meetings to try and hand uh, bin Laden over. You know, the US was demanding it. No agreement was ever really worked out. And of course, uh, what ends up happening uh, on the heels of a series of um, attacks um, by Al Qaeda on uh, U.S. targets abroad um, is are the events of of 9/11, and 9/11 is also the beginning of the war on terror, and specifically the war on terror as it relates to um, the Muslim world. Now, terrorism in the Cold War was really primarily associated with secular political factions. There was not a sense of it being religiously or culturally informed. Um, in the 90s and after 9/11, certainly it becomes fused very clearly with uh, a notion of, you know, quote unquote, radical Islam. And that incites a lot of prejudices similar to those around communism in prior decades. But at this time, it has a kind of cultural basis. And there's a lot of work attempted by uh, intellectuals and politicians to, to justify that. The Bush administration also receives a blank check from Congress to use military force against these sort of unspecified terrorist enemies under the justification of the war on terror. Uh, that, that bill, the authorization for use of military force, um, is, was uh, only uh, disputed by one um, congressperson. As well, the, the war uh, turns its scope inward, um, and the Patriot Act uh, enables uh, the surveillance, the widespread surveillance, and extra legal detention of Muslim Americans as well as any perceived you know, uh, enemies of the state. And uh, additionally, um, you know, within this context, you know, we saw this quote uh, a little before really the, 
the main thrust of it is that there was not a whole lot of actual expertise on Afghanistan in the United States. Although there had been this sort of flash in the pan moment of, of engagement in the 1980s, um, there was not an infrastructure of knowledge to really base U US policies on the country from. And although the US has extreme success in its first few months of the military campaign, sweeping uh, across the country and sweeping the Taliban away, um, first of all, they don't they don't capture you know enemy number one Osama bin Laden. He escapes narrowly during a during a battle. But um, they've now occupied this country, and the question arises of what now? Um, because the the perception was that terrorism, as it existed, as it as had um, motivated the attacks on the twin towers in New York, was not stamped out. And this is when we gain the reason to stay in Afghanistan. Um, I'm going to try to play this clip. So just give me one moment. All right. Good morning. I'm Can I Laura thumbs Bush, up from and I'm delivering here. this week's radio address to kick off a worldwide effort to focus on the brutality against women and children Thank by you. the Al Qaeda terrorist network and the regime it supports in Afghanistan, the Taliban. That regime is now in retreat across much of the country, and the people of Afghanistan, especially women, are rejoicing. Afghan women know through hard experience what the rest of the world is discovering. The brutal oppression of women is a central goal of the terrorist. Long before the current war began, the Taliban and its terrorist allies were making the lives of children and women in Afghanistan miserable. Seventy percent of the Afghan people are malnourished. One in every four children won't live past the age of five because health care is not available. Women have been denied access to doctors when they're sick. Life under the Taliban is so hard and repressive, even small displays of joy are outlawed. Children aren't allowed to fly kites. Their mothers face beatings for laughing out loud. Women cannot work outside the home or even leave their homes by themselves. The severe repression and brutality against women in Afghanistan is not a matter of legitimate religious practice. Muslims around the world have condemned the brutal degradation of women and children by the Taliban regime. The poverty, poor health, and illiteracy that the terrorists and the Taliban have imposed on women in Afghanistan do not conform with the treatment of women in most of the Islamic world, where women make important contributions in their societies. Fighting brutality against women and children is not the expression of a specific culture. It's the acceptance of our common humanity a commitment shared by people of goodwill on every continent. The fight against terrorism is also a fight for the rights and dignity of women. So when Laura Bush makes this, this radio announcement, and this is happening in, you know, around the end of November in 2001, aligning with the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States, the Taliban was in extreme retreat and would soon surrender. Um, and you know, though it, it aligns with, you know, a lot of the, the Bush administration's rhetoric at this time that the war on terror was not a war on Islam, uh, that, um, you know, this was not the intention of the war on terror to, to destroy Islamic practice. Um, however, it, it does provide a convincing reason to remain in the country. The reason, of course, is that women and children are being, you know, oppressed and that the United States by implication, is there to save them, to provide humanitarian support, to um, improve their lives and their conditions in the country, and enable them to make you know, contributions uh, to Afghanistan's uh, politics and, and culture. This becomes a very convincing reason. Yeah, and there. there are you know, several uh, public displays of this, this narrative happening. This is, a, you know, again, a slide we've seen before. This is about uh, a performance of the of Eve Ensler's vagina monologues um, in New York, where uh, Oprah Winfrey reads a, a poem 
about the plight of Islamic women and then uh, essentially removes the headscarf of an Afghan woman named Zoya uh, from um, her head. And, you know, this is interpreted. Uh, this is a great book um, about this exact topic and about um, Muslim women in the United States after 9-11. This is a this is a symbolic gesture of uh, the United States being, you know, the American person being the, the one that will lead the Afghan into modernity. Of course, that symbolic gesture is is by devailing this person and, and stripping them of their uh, outward kind of Islamic identity and expression of religious piety. These, you know, uh, we've we've talked about these stereotypes before, and you know, uh, I think this quote kind of sets the stage. These lurking insecurities, what are they? Well, you know, of course, there is the the memory of the pure evil enemy of you know the the Nazis. Um, there is the standard kind of um, crazed uh, terrorist look that we get in these cartoons, but. These are not these cartoons are not just cartoons right they're exhibiting a cultural influence and certainly there is also serious thinking by um scholars people you know who studied the muslim world their entire lives trying to justify this this idea that you know there is a muslim rage out there and that they're trying to to get us uh you know us being you know americans who believe in democracy and and all that and you know it leads to cultural portrayals of the war in Afghanistan, you know, especially these kinds of war movies that are about Americans abroad. But of course, it's not just movies and representations, it leads to real consequences. And one of those worst consequences was the establishment of a veritable uh, network of torture sites around the world, uh, sponsored by um, the United States, where detainees from the war in Afghanistan, as well as the war in Iraq, which began in 2003, um, were stored uh, under no, you know, legal um, justification, and were tortured. Um, and, you know, this this photo is is what became the the most uh, prominent representation of this torture program. I actually don't think this is the worst photo. Uh, there are far worse ones. Um, and I, I mean, I, I didn't uh, want to show them today, but you can, you can look up, uh, you know, some of the photographs from. Uh, Abu Ghraib and uh, the other black sites. Um, if you're if you're interested in seeing the the true brutality of uh, what these stereotypes and these dehumanizing portrayals of Muslims and of Afghans uh, created, as the 2000s roll along, the United States is enacting these policies uh, in line with the idea that it is um, humanitarily occupying Afghanistan, that the invasion of, of Afghanistan was a humanitarian war um, in order to bring Afghanistan into the 21st century. Um, oh, my notes are visible. I'm so sorry. I'm spoiling all the fun. Um, let me see if that works better. All right. Hopefully my notes are not now visible. Um, Thank you, Zach. Um, now, as the 2000s roll along, the United States is enmeshed in Afghanistan and the Taliban is gone, but they have found a narrative to stay that it is, you know, again, this humanitarian invasion and that they will um, renew this country through US support. The main themes become the influx of American money and resources that is channeled through the military uh, as well as non-governmental organizations, NGOs. But what this leads to is not an independent state, but a dependent state. Um, there are enormous amounts of contracts issued by the US Army for everything from transportation of supplies to uh, private security for uh, convoys. And all of this floods money into the Afghan economy. But what this does is essentially create a, a mafia-like system of kickbacks where there is so much demand for these contracts that um, people will almost do anything. And what that includes is building shells of schools that are supposedly operable or shells of medical clinics and show, you know, taking a photo and sending it to the contractor uh, 
to help justify their data points. But what these are are hollow figures. And at the same time, while this money is flooding into the the Afghan economy and enriching, you know, these sort of mafia don like figures, uh, the United States is also engaging in this performative destruction of aspects of the Afghan economy that were uh, not suitable for the idea, you know, the ideal modern state. That includes the opium harvest, which uh, certainly was um, providing an enormous amount of, of funds for uh, the Taliban and for the Mujahideen in previous decades. But at its at its root, uh, you know, at its first level was uh, the source of income for many off, poor Afghan farmers. Um, U.S. forces and U.S. allied forces burn these crops en masse. And there's actually a fantastic documentary uh, called Opium Brides, which shows the effect of this uh, policy. Um, many of these farmers uh, had to resort to uh, really desperate means at that point to feed their families, and that included selling uh, their daughters uh, essentially into into slavery as as young brides. Um, I I would you know certainly say this is not the ideal outcome of uh, the modernizing campaign. The additional layer of this is that. Um, the United States, when it comes into Afghanistan, is looking for allies. Many of those allies were members of the Northern Alliance, who uh, were former Mujahideen fighters and um, were, at, you know, explicitly anti-Taliban. Their their enemy was the Taliban movement, and they sought to. Let me see the opium side. God. Sorry, Zach. Um, thank you for for informing me about all this. Zach, does that look okay? Yeah, it looks yeah. good now. Okay. Um, what occurs is the return of the Mujahideen warlords to power. Um, they are seen as by the US as their allies in the fight against the Taliban. Even when the Taliban is expelled from Afghanistan, they remain as their, their most uh, loyal, you know, supposedly allies. And unfortunately, these warlords were the same people that, you know, Afghans who were alive at the time remembered being extremely exploitative, you know, not necessarily any better than the Taliban at that point. People who uh, engaged in kidnappings, who instituted a system of widespread kickbacks uh, where, you know, everyone had to pay a share of their salary essentially for protection. And these warlords return with a vengeance. Uh, they not only engage in all the corrupt behaviors that they were beforehand, they're doing so with the cover of the war on terror, that they are uh, rooting out terrorists, and specifically Taliban. And they are also seeking to essentially uh, enact uh, reprisals against their rivals and against people who they saw as having undermined them um, during the civil war. Of course, the cover of the war on terror also leads to uh, a really unfortunate consequence, which is that there were not a lot of Taliban at the time. In the early 2000s, the Taliban had been, uh, you know, essentially uh, thrown out of the country and that those who weren't didn't flee to uh, other countries or go underground went back into civil life and became ordinary people. And, and they were not they disassociated themselves with the movement and renounced uh, those those ideas. But there were still contracts, uh, essentially, for um, high value targets for high value Taliban members who were out there plotting against the United States. And many of these Mujahideen uh, uh, warlords now turned kind of US allies, regional governors, mayors, um, would turn in their rivals, who might have been innocent people, for those cash rewards and could justify that by saying that they were Taliban. Uh, warlords. Um, I don't know. My notes are frozen. There we go. Additionally, a lot. Of, you know, a lot of this is happening in the rural areas where drone strikes become kind of the norm of uh, the U.S. war, where the effectively the only engagement between Afghans and the United States was either a person in boots with an M16 or a drone hovering above their head for hours during a day. Um, if you've read any news about drone strikes, you know that uh, a persistent issue is targeting. Um, many, many innocent people have, have died 
um, because of faulty targeting and, you know, none so more than in uh, these marginalized areas of Afghanistan where, uh, you know, the United States was attempting to fight a war from, from uh, you know, a drone center in Omaha, um, you know, not uh, on the ground working with, with individuals. Of course, the allies that the United States was engaging with in, in Afghanistan were also extremely corrupt and had their own uh, agendas. And um, that extended from the local leaders to the Karzai administration. Uh, Hamid Karzai, who we talked about, was the first president of Afghanistan. Um, his administration sees that uh, these local leaders are sucking up the money from the US, uh, you know, kind of military industrial complex that had been set up in Afghanistan and engages in active competition with these people. And so the, the central government itself becomes a kind of uh, petty, you know, mafia figure um, competing with its own regional governors and mayors. And actually, as things deteriorated um, in 2020, and uh, early 2021 in Afghanistan, a lot of those regional leaders essentially um, said, you know, we're not coming to your aid, we're gonna defend our own city um, when the central government in Kabul asked for reinforcements. Okay, so what this does, you know, in, in the end is create what uh, this journalist who I really admire, Anand Gopal, calls a country built almost entirely for show. And that is really what Afghanistan uh, served as for the United States. It served as these hollow data points to indicate how positive the US impact on a developing country was. Um, and there were all these statistics that were trotted out, like the amount of um, students in school, particularly how many women were in school, uh, as well as how many Afghans had access to healthcare. And what this book shows in particular uh, through um, the, personal perspectives of three different Afghans um, is how faulty that narrative really was. Um, one, one really like, you know, uh, profound statistic was that was about how many schools were operating. Well, uh, he quotes an independent investigation that showed 80% of those schools were not actually operating at all in a certain uh, province, the province of Gore, and that uh, there were 4,000 teachers still on payroll, but the dues that, you know, the income that they were receiving was going towards, uh, essentially, you know, protection dues to local officials and warlords. We're then taking that money to buy influence with uh, their higher ups. Um, similarly, uh, another quote, uh, you know, <laughs> good data point was that 85% of Afghans had access to healthcare. Um, in fact, uh, the figure uh, turned out to refer, this is a quote, direct quote from the book, only to the fact that 85% of districts had at least one healthcare which many Afghans could not access due to distance or insecurity. That would be akin to saying that just because every state in the US had a hospital, 100% of Americans had access to healthcare, end quote. And again, like the schools, many of these facilities were actually inoperative. So um, I, I don't uh, want to summarize this whole book. It, it's a fantastic read and actually uh, rather than being um, uh, set in the halls of, of power. It is about th three lives of, of individual Afghans. Um, I can't, if you're going to read one book about Afghanistan and the, the US war specifically, read this one, please. Um, it, it, is a, it is a really uh, profound study of the situation uh, that occurred over 20 years during the US war. And, and it is certainly also one um, that respects the agency and the independence of ordinary Afghans trying to lead lives uh, soaked in tragedy uh, over the course of 20 years during the US war with the memory of decades of war behind them. Um, okay, that is uh, what I have on the US war and I am happy to take questions at this point. And I'm going to uh, just say if you want to type them in the chat or raise your hand, please do so. And as you know, if you're kind of thinking about uh, what you'd like to to uh, you know ask, I, I would also just say you know um, please reflect on some of these questions as well because you know again many of you will 
hopefully go on to active volunteer engagement. And um, I, I would love to also hear um, from you about what your experience of, of this war was as, as people living here, watching the news, hearing these narratives, um, as well as what you're hoping to bring forward. Um, but um, otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. I know I went late again. Uh, I'm terrible with timing, but I hope that that was informative um, and useful to you. Yeah, thanks again, Krishna. Um, another another really enlightening presentation. Um, not only did I learn that K is for Klishnikov, but I learned some actual interesting things about the history of Afghanistan. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, please, uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to use the raise your hand fu function or um, you can post them in the chat. So I think Bob sent me a message directly. Is there a sense of national identity in Afghanistan or is one's identity from uh, their province or tribe? Is the situation in Afghanistan as it would be here in the US if someone like me thought of himself first as an Illinoisan and secondly, only secondarily as an American? Yeah, this is a this is a great question. Um, I, I certainly, if you if you weren't at last week's session, encourage you to check out the, the recording as we, we go over um, some of the, the early attempts to forge a national identity for Afghans uh, in the 20th century. And, and a lot of those revolved around trying to, um, you know, put the puzzle pieces together in a country that has no majority kind of uh, ethno-linguistic group to put the pieces together to make something that was fitting. Uh, Islam served as one of those categories. For some people, um, they, they simply said, this is a Pashtun uh, state. This is a country that should be ruled by Pashtuns uh, in their eyes. And um, that, that the, there were a lot of competing visions. And of course, then, you know, as we looked at in the 70s, there were then ideas about, um, well, Afghanistan could be part of the um, world of uh, leftist uh, communist uh, you know, rule and that uh, you know, there will be a people's government in Afghanistan as there are in, in other parts of the world. There were attempts, you know, active attempts to link the cause of Afghan nationalism to causes of nationalism elsewhere. And, you know, I think what, uh, certainly a, a motivating factor in a lot of the, the conflict has been arguing over what, what that conception is. And the dominant conception that came out of the 70s was that uh, Islamic government is the way forward for Afghanistan. But between the Mujahideen themselves, as well as between the Mujahideen and the Taliban, there was no strict agreement about what that might be. Um, certainly the fact that uh, Afghan, Afghans are primarily living in rural areas contributes to um, a notion of identity that is really rooted in their local place as, where as, as well as their local town or local tribe, um, particularly among Pashtuns. Um, there are, you know, there's a enormous tree of tribal affiliations, which um, I don't certainly have not memorized, but you can check out um, online. Judy asks, uh, or Tammy asked, uh, I think for, oh, sorry, <laughs> there, are, there are questions a little bit above. Um, Lena asked, how about Ashraf Ghani's government? Is he is promoted as a modern progressive leader? The, the Ghani administration took power after, um, you know, I think it might, might have been 14 years of, of uh, Hamid Karzai's presidency, uh, or maybe a bit longer, I'm, I'm now sketchy on the details. But in any case, uh, Hamid Karzai had, had ruled the country and been its most prominent uh, representative uh, for over a decade uh, of the, you know, independent post-US uh, government. And, you know, the Ghani administration uh, came to power uh, under pretty dire straits. Uh, this was the first election, uh, you know, uh, since the, the US invasion. And um, not only was the election very difficult, you know, there were there were images of donkeys carrying uh, the voting ballots from really remote mountainous parts of Afghanistan back to Kabul. Um, but there, there was also a essentially an impasse created that the constitution did not um, really allow for. Um, which was that uh, there, the, the two candidates who got the most votes, Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah, essentially tied. Um, and so they had to create a new position for Abdullah Abdullah. He became the chief executive of Afghanistan. 
um, and Ashraf Ghani became the prime minister. And uh, Abdullah Abdullah had significant support among Tajiks and um, non-Pashtun groups, uh, whereas Ashraf Ghani, you know, himself is Pashtun and, and had significant support among Pashtuns. So the U.S. brokered sort of uh, agreement in, after the election was that they would essentially share power. Um, as a result, uh, you know, whatever you might think of Ashraf Ghani, I mean, he, he was actually a professor in the U.S. for quite a while uh, who went back to Afghanistan to enter politics. Um, he, his, his administration was extremely controversial and uh, certainly as the, the war deteriorated, uh, showed signs of, of real incompetence. Um, you know, he, didn't, he did not appear to have the wherewithal to really manage um, the situation. And then when the US left, you know, really the writing had been on the wall. Um, I believe Abdullah Abdullah is still in the country um, attempting, you know, some sorts of, of negotiations with the Taliban. Any way to leave the country more successfully with the chaotic situation? Um, I am not a, a politician or war planner, so I, I can't, uh, you know, necessarily say whether there was a way to um, minimize the kinds of uh, casualties and chaos that we saw. Um, but um, it is useful to say that the Taliban came back um, because of U.S. mismanagement in the, in the country. Uh, as as I said, you know, the Taliban surrendered within a few months of the US invasion initially, but they came back with a force later in the 2000s because of how much the US had antagonized ordinary Afghans. Um, that they, the perception really was that they had, the US had, invasion had brought them back to the Civil War era kinds of disagreements and, um, and violence, except that there was US money everywhere that implicated in doing those things as well as a war on terror that appeared to punish ordinary people rather than um, you know, actual violent actors who they saw in positions of power. Um, so one way to have left the country more successfully would have been to not engage in the kinds of um, corrupt politics with these you know, local warlords um, in the first place. But after the Taliban came back, the their case for, for expelling the United States was quite convincing, which is that the US was, was mismanaging the, the situation and was actively hurting Afghans, which they were. Um, as a result, we were, you know, the US was left with you know, worse and bad options, essentially. Um, there was not really going to be a good way to exit uh, at that point. Do you have a sense of how much money went to U.S. contractors versus direct aid or help to people of Afghanistan? Um, you know, there are great projects uh, on how much money has been spent on the war in Afghanistan. One of them is by the Watson Institute at Brown University. Um, they also tally how many people have died in the war in Afghanistan. Um, I would certainly look at that. Um, it's, it's very hard to say what uh, direct aid means in this context because given that there was a military occupation of, of the country, almost everything went through Department of Defense certified uh, kinds of organizations or NGOs um, or people. And those NGOs were serving uh, the warlords. You know, they saw them as their intermediaries on the local level. And so it, it, it's very difficult to say what if any money went you know, directly from the hands of a donor into an ordinary Afghan because that situation, the infrastructure for that kind of situation did not exist, unfortunately. Um, Jim asks <laughs> an unfair question, what will the future likely bring for Afghanistan? Um, it's very difficult to say. I think uh, I, I would love to answer this question in a year or more when we see uh, what, if any, um, new, you know, new features of Taliban uh, governance are, um, but it is safe to say, I think, given the way the war had went, and especially the last final few months that um, no faction, and this is an unfortunate fact, no, no single faction possesses the capability militarily to rule the country aside from the Taliban. Um, but whether they possess the capability to politically engage in the kind of government that has been set up so far, or whether they seek to create a new kind of government, 
is is hard to say. We we will just have to kind of wait and see. Um, Jean Isabel, what will we expect the attitude towards Americans from the Afghan refugees we meet? Um, something you will hear persistently is that Afghans are some of the most hospitable people you will ever meet in the world, um, more so than even you know their peers in an already hospitable region. Um, there are a number of examples of uh, Western people walking across Afghanistan and being uh, brought in um, to, to the homes of Afghans, of ordinary Afghans, walked across dangerous stretches of land by them for with no kind of expectation of uh, financial recompense. Um, and so um, that being said, I, I would encourage you to broach these conversations about what they think of the United States, what they think of Americans. Um, because certainly, given the workshop content that we've covered this past month, uh, that is a conversation we need to have. And actually, uh, a, a organization that um, I really admire is, is uh, it's based in the Twin Cities. It's called the Iraqi and uh, American Reconciliation Project, IARP, uh, which has attempted to essentially do the, just that, um, to broach this conversation publicly and actively uh, around the relationship between Americans and Iraqis, uh, given the war in Iraq. Um, so I would check out their work uh, if you're interested in, you know, engaging in some of those conversations yourself. Kathleen asks, any recommendations for news sources or organizations to follow to get less biased sources of news about Afghanistan at this point? Um, I actually have a list of those in my uh, session resources, and, and I will send those out via Zach. Um, yes, I do have some recommendations. And I also recommended, you know, given that we're in, in the age of, um, you know, Twitter and, and, and Substack, you know, Zach himself is, is on Substack now. Um, I also recommended some individual journalists who I think have done fantastic work. Um, Emmy asked, given the many divisions and lack of a consistent central government that could deliver services and assistance, would you expect that the current outflow of Afghan refugees hope to eventually return to Afghanistan or did the US withdrawal completely ruin their chance for life in their homeland? I am sure that uh, those refugees would like to return home. Um, Unfortunately, what the, the you know the situation is is that you know those Afghans who have lived since the you know uh, invasion of the Soviet Union in in seventy nine, uh, which which are there are a lot of Afghans who are still alive from that time. Um, you know, it it is very I think difficult for many of them if they've left at this point to foresee um, a world where this conflict does not drag on because uh, the fundamental premises of it have not really changed. Uh, there are still many uh, large countries interested in Afghanistan's um, oil reserves and their mineral wealth. Uh, there are many, you know, Afghanistan is still in a strategic position on the map. Um, and it is wedged between uh, several countries uh, that can that also attract international attention. Um, so it, it, it's it's very difficult to say what you know, you, you will have to ask the Afghans who you meet. Uh, what um, their hope is about returning home. But um, I certainly think that um, to have come all this way it, it, uh, at this point, you know, the, the, I, the hope is that the conflict ends because um, that is really the, the primary driver. And, and the US uh, occupation for 20 years did not do much to take away the premises of further conflict. Um, uh, mention of Barbara Lee, who voted against the AUMF, that absolutely justified. Joseph asked, any sense of what is actually going on politically right now? Um, currently, it appears that there is a uh, careful dance between the Taliban uh, political leaders and uh, existing political leaders from the previous government to stake out the terms of what um, the new Afghan government, the shape of the new Afghan government will be, whether that's uh, the form of elections or uh, who will get to run that kind of thing. Um, and it's all it's there's a seemingly a push and pull when I read news coverage regarding the Taliban's perspective on things like women's rights. Uh, recently, several universities were opened uh, that take female students, but um, or reopened since the since uh, their takeover of Kabul. But um, at the same time, um, there are violent repression of, of protesters, and, and certainly uh, there's been threats towards journalists. It appears that, that uh, similarly to in the 90s, the Taliban didn't, did not come into uh, these positions of high power with a uh, 
existing kind of politically savvy leadership when it came to the you know daily grind of policy. Um, it, it, it seems like a lot of the people, especially in, in the lower ranks who are engaging with Afghans directly, who are serving as security guards or mayors or whatever, um, don't have the political experience maybe necessary to, to uh, run those things as effectively as they could be. At the same time, uh, there are also Taliban guards now guarding um, Shia mosques. And you know the first iteration of the Taliban brutally suppressed uh, the practice of Shiism in the country. So perhaps that is a positive sign. Um, again, it's kind of a wait and see. Um, I think we'll we'll get a better sense as as the months go on. Lena asks, would you recommend any book or resources regarding family dynamic and structure in Afghan society? Um, there is a well. I, I certainly think again. I'll, I'll recommend No Good Men Among the Living for the simple fact that it follows um, one. Uh, Afghan woman who uh, lives in, in a rural area uh, and, and tells her story. Um, you know, Gopal spent several years uh, in the country interviewing these people. And so it, it, it tracks her life as well as her own experience of family dynamics across the Taliban period through the, the kind of US war. Um, in terms of if you're asking about academic books, um, I can certainly, uh, you know, get back to you about that. Um, I will put my email in the chat so that people can um, write me with questions. Um, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, Krishna, so as we, I, I see that we're at time, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to offer maybe one more question by way of closing. Um, I mean, it, I think we would be remiss not to notice the fact that as we're preparing to welcome Afghan refugees today, and as this war, you know, just ended um, a few months ago, the United States uh, looks poised to be involved in another war, to start another war um, in the Ukraine with Russia. Um, I'm wondering whether you want to speak to that point or just generally, what are the larger takeaways um, when you think about the U.S. war in Afghanistan? What are the lessons that, you know, average Americans need to learn from this war um, about how we relate to our supposed, supposed enemies, how we define them. Um, what are your, what are your larger takeaways there? Yeah. Um, thanks, Zach. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, so I can't speak to anything about the internal dynamics of Ukrainian politics, but in terms of writ large, uh, about American foreign policy and especially about, uh, foreign wars, um, I will remind you of a quote from that video about explaining the concept of Orientalism that we watched in, in the first session, which is about uh, what is the narrative, right? Watch the narrative, R notice in the news, um, whether it's news writers reporting on what uh, political leaders are saying or what opinion writers are saying, what is the narrative about a conflict? Because I think, you know, when we look at the way that the, Vietnam War was marketed to the American public, when we look at the way that the war in Afghanistan was marketed to the public or the war in Iraq, there is always a convincing story. And it can be very difficult, especially when we, you know, we live in a world where this kind of information is guarded and coveted and usually um, confidential at the time when it is revealed. Um, it can be very difficult to fact check uh, those narratives. But I encourage you to think critically about what the interests are really i mean what the pragmatic interests are because as much as we might want to believe that our country's political leaders are willing to uh commit uh real resources time uh, money lives towards purely humanitarian causes that is never the case in any historical context um there's always a material or real interest and it might be it might be soft power, right? Relationships with other politicians or other uh, political leaders in countries or particular factions, or it might be a physical resource like oil or uh, something like that. But um, there will always be a narrative, right? And sometimes there are competing narratives about what to do. And, and, and I think the story of the war in Afghanistan is one of um, a very convincing narrative built off of a collective moment of, of trauma in this country around 9-11 uh, and the shock value of that event um, 
you know, lurching the American public into engaging with a part of the world that meant essentially nothing to them uh, prior to that moment. Uh, and a very similar effect actually happened with Vietnam. And I think, uh, you know, for those of you who were alive at the time, uh, I, I certainly wasn't. Uh, there, are, there are now a lot of uh, very interesting comparisons being made um, between the ways that American political leaders have tried to convince Americans to get on board with wars in places that don't have, um, you know, a concrete uh, interest for ordinary people. Um, and yet we have all sp spent portions of our tax bills the past 20 years contributing to this war in Afghanistan. Um, and if anything else, uh, I encourage you to think critically about what that money actually went to. And, and somebody thankfully dropped the link to the, the Watson report, uh, the Watson Institute at Brown. Uh, they, they have uh, compiled a aggregate sum for how much the war in Afghanistan costs, uh, as well as the aggregate human toll. Um, so think, think about those two things, the lives that have been lost and, and the, the money that has been spent and, and ask yourself really critically whether it's worth it. And especially when it comes to the next, the next conflict. Um, and I, I guess that that's, that's the best answer I can provide for now at least. Thank you, Krishna. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks again to, to all of our co-sponsors today at Grow Forward, Mira, um, Refugee Action Network, Refugee One. Um, hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Um, again, uh, my name is Zach Whitus, uh, uh, volunteer coordinator at the Syrian Community Network. Um, you've been listening to Krishna Kolkarni, the outreach coordinator uh, at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today. Um, you'll be getting uh, an email in due time with some, some resources from Krishna. Um, and yeah, thanks again for, for attending. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.